Welcome to the Live to 110 podcast. My name is Wendy Myers and I am your host. Today we have on Dr. Paul Jaminet, author with his wife uh, of The Perfect Health Diet. And today we're going to be talking specifically about how to use the perfect health diet for weight loss because I've had a lot of clients and a lot of listeners uh, that love the perfect health diet, uh, which is a paleo and primal inspired diet, and want to know how they can tweak it for weight loss. So today we're going to be talking about fats, carbs, fructose, and all the little tweaks that you need to, to make to maximize the perfect health diet for weight loss. And uh, basically, we are going to uh, first do the disclaimer. Uh, please keep in mind that this program is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or health condition and is not a substitute for professional medical advice. The Live to 110 podcast is solely informational in nature, so please consult your healthcare practitioner before engaging in any treatment that we suggest on the show. And if you want to go to the, the new live to 110.com that recently got a facelift, you can download my live to 110 by wing less 35 page e-guide. And you can also download my five free modern paleo survival guides, which are little charts about fats and proteins and a few other charts that will help you to navigate your modern paleo diet. And if you also want to learn about my program, Mineral Power, um, it's a wonderful program using hair mineral analysis to heal health conditions and to detox heavy metals and chemicals. You can go just tr press the Mineral Power button on my website, liveto110.com. Now today we're going to be talking with Dr. Paul Jaminet. Um, he was an astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and he became a software entrepreneur during the internet boom. And he now provides strategic advice to entrepreneurial companies while pursuing research in economics. And you can see pauljaminet.com for more information on that. Paul's wife, uh, Su Ching Jaminet, uh, who co-authored The Perfect Health Diet, is a molecular biologist and cancer researcher at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Harvard Medical School. Dr. Jaminet and his wife have collaborated for many years on their book, The Perfect Health Diet, on what they think is the perfect diet for optimal health. And it's a paleo or ancestral based diet, but tweaked based upon their extensive research and dietary knowledge. Uh, so Paul, thank you so much for being on the show again. Uh, thank you, Andy, it's great to be here. So why don't you first tell the listeners, um, you know, how you went from astrophysics <laughs> to developing the perfect health diet and how you and your wife managed to write what I think is really one of the best books on diet. Well, um, it was a long journey and uh, um, I would say in some ways we were inspired by uh, the early deaths of our parents. So. Uh, Xiao Qing lost her father to a stroke when she was 12 and I lost my mother to cancer when I was 10 and uh, you know so that that actually is what led Xiao Qing to go into a health career um, I didn't go into that originally uh, but um, you know it, it definitely gave me some interest and then uh, we both developed health problems uh, in adulthood and uh, and they kept getting worse every year and we weren't getting any help with doctors and ultimately we realized that diet uh, was a key part of the solution for us diet and lifestyle and uh, uh, we found the paleo diet uh, found that it had problems that we needed to fix we spent a number of years of research fixing them and then decided we had to share what we would learned as perfect health diet and we did succeed uh, about five years after discovering paleo, we finally did fix our health problems. And the Perfect Health Diet has helped thousands of people fix their health. And, you know, so we're really excited by what we've learned and, you know, we're trying to figure out how to spread it to the, to the whole world. Do you have another edition coming out at some point? I know you do ongoing research. No, not a, not of the book. So we've revised it. Uh, we have a Scribner edition that came out. So the most recent uh, just came out six months ago, a paperback edition from Scribner. Okay. And we don't have any plans to revise that at the moment. Um, but what we are doing, we're working hard on a cookbook. Oh, great. Um, right. So we expect to have that uh, finished by the end of the year. And 
that will also be an easy introduction to how to eat the perfect health diet. Yeah. Um, and you know, you won't need to know much science if you if you want to know the reasons for everything. You can go read the original book, but the cookbook, you know, I think it'll really help people learn how to cook and uh, you know learn how to be creative chefs and meal designers. So I think it's going to be a really good book. Yeah, I love and, on your site how you have pictures of every step that you do in the recipe. Yeah. Um, I think that's really, really helpful. I mean, you have so many recipes on there. I think it's really helpful to help people know how to cook who don't know how to cook. Yeah. And then I'm also working on video products. So I'm planning to do a series of video courses, uh, one on diet, one on nutrition, one on lifestyle, one on exercise, one on cooking, and one on health management. Fantastic. And so, the, you know, those are my big projects. And then we also have a health retreat uh, that meets for two weeks in May, two weeks in October where you can come have a luxury vacation on the beach at the, you know, what may be the nicest property on the east coast of the U.S. Uh, fantastic beach, fantastic water, hot tubs, pools, you know, everything you, know, you, know, you can think of in a luxury vacation. And we'll have, you know, a great chef making Ph.D. food. We'll have cooking classes before every meal. Uh, I give, you know, two science education classes a day. We have three physical training sessions where we teach, you know, not only fitness, but uh, how to prepare yourself for sleep, how to heal yourself. And so it's a pretty comprehensive education, you know, how to shape your environment, you know, how to implement an ancestral lifestyle in the modern world. And, uh, and we're excited about that because we also give health coaching in exchange for people that track their health outcomes. And we're hoping to really prove that ancestral diet and lifestyle can, you know, cure things. Yeah. Um, Where is your retreat located? Uh, it's on North Topsail Beach on Topsail Island off mm -hmm. North Carolina. That's oh, one of the barrier yeah. islands. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, so it's south of Cape Hatteras and a little north of Wilmington. And it's a beautiful location. And, uh, um, you know, it's a great idea. You can go on our website. There's a tab for Perfect Health Retreat and check out the photos under there. Did you have one in Austin? Uh, yeah. yeah. We had uh, we did a pilot program in Austin, Texas, and uh, and that had terrific health results. So we decided, all right, we may we need to make this uh, you know a full blown business, and uh, you know, but we wanted to you know give people a, a luxury vacation as well as mm -hmm. a health retreat, and so we thought being on the beach in a great location would be a you know would be a bonus. That's great. So is it ongoing, or do you just will have it intermittently? Well, at the moment we're doing two a year okay. uh, in May and October, and uh, it goes for two weeks. But you can come just for one week, either the first week or the second week. Um, so we have complete one-week programs, and uh, uh, you know, not all of the material repeats. So there's fresh material for the people there for two weeks, and they can also the material that does repeat. They can skip the session and get one-on-one. -on -one you know, personal one-on-one -on -one work with trainers or the chef or, right. uh, you know, so I, I think it'll, I think it'll work really well whether you have one week or two weeks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, my girlfriend uh, is dying to go. <laughs> oh, way, I hope she comes. Dying to go. <laughs> she, well, loves, she loves your bug. She worships it. That's a, uh, she's a uh, very, very knowledgeable about nutrition. And she said, your bug is the go-to that she goes to every time because it's so detailed and there's so many studies you have a thousand scientific studies to yeah. support what you're saying so it's just really a phenomenal book you just did a phenomenal job on it I recommend yeah. it to all my clients as well all right well thank you very much and tell your friend I want to meet her yeah <laughs> she should come she would love to talk to you um, but she said she gave me a list of all these questions she wanted me to answer ask you <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to get to a few of those Okay. Um, but so first, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about weight loss and what in your opinion is the recipe for weight loss in regards to fat, carbs, or both? Like just a short answer. What is the formula that people need to work on? Yeah. Well, um, you know, weight loss, so obesity is not, it, in many ways it's a simple thing uh, because, you know, the best solution is really an ancestral diet and lifestyle. You know, but there's a lot of factors that go in and there's a lot of mistakes you can make. And the first thing I would say to people, if you want to lose weight, don't focus on weight first, focus on health first. Yes. And, 
nearly everything that damages your health will uh, inhibit weight loss and if you improve your health your weight will tend to normalize and that's a clear benefit you know if you're uh, if, if you're fixing health you're really helping yourself and in fact there have been studies showing that you know you can be quite obese but have the same mortality risk as slender people just by you know engaging in a healthy diet and lifestyle and um, you know, so it's really only the combination of a bad diet and lifestyle with obesity that leads to the health risks that we associate with it. Um, you know, so the first step is really tend to your health. And, um, and it's curious, I'm going to be speaking about this at the Ancestral Health Symposium this year, but a few of the factors that promote obesity are actually health improving. You know, and so uh, you know, for like a hundred years from 1860 to 1960 or so, we saw obesity rates go up very slowly, but we also saw, you know, health increasing, stature increasing, lifespans increasing. You know, so providing yourself with a little more energy is not always a bad thing. You know, often you get more nutrition with that and your health improves. And we've also found over the years that people can really damage their health by going on diets and a lot of people do do that and so you have to be careful about calorie restriction um, you know so especially when people are eating bad diets unhealthy diets and they just keep the same diet but reduce try to reduce food intake yeah, yeah then they're sure to damage their health because Craig, hello. yeah you know <laughs> so you know their diet was malnourishing it was damaging their health before and then they make it even more malnourishing by restricting food intake yeah I have a lot of clients that have I don't want to say permanently damaged, but seriously damaged their metabolism by doing low calorie diets long term and it, it destroys yeah. their thyroid yeah. and causes malnutrition and then they have then they can't lose weight no matter what they do. Right. Yeah, and then, you know, people get scared, you know, as soon as they normalize their food intake, their weight balloons up again and um, you know, so it, it's very frustrating for people. And the way around that is focus on health first don't worry about weight first and then after you you fixed your health you know then you can do some t tweaks for extra fat you know for a faster weight loss yeah. uh, and weight normalization so that's the first thing I would say you know so the first step toward weight loss is really implement all of our advice yeah. uh, you know perfect health diet perfect health lifestyle just do what I say <laughs> yeah that's right and you know the reason we named it that is because you know, we realize there's really hundreds of things that you need to optimize. And most health problems today, they're not things that, are, that have a single cause. You know, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, when, you know, the, when medicine sort of came into its own, you know, they were discovering germs and they discovered lots of diseases that had a single germ as a cause, or they discovered the key nutrients and they found diseases like beriberi or pellagra you know, that were caused by just a deficiency of one nutrient. And so those diseases had, you know, they all had a magic bullet. You know, if you, if you treat um, syphilis with penicillin, then you can get rid of it, or tuberculosis, or um, if you vaccinate against polio, then you can prevent it. And, or if you give, uh, you know, vitamin B1, you can prevent beriberi. Um, but modern chronic diseases, they don't have magic bullet solutions because they don't have one cause. They've got dozens of causes that are conspiring together. And often we don't know all the causes, all right? And obesity is like that. You know, there's probably in most people who are obese, there are 30 causes. And so in order to fix them, you really need to address all or most of the causes. And that means what the mindset you need to have is, uh, I'm going to seek perfection. I'm going to fix all the little things. Uh, and that's why we named our diet Perfect Health Diet because we want people to come with that mindset. I'm going to try to optimize every aspect of my diet and nutrition, and that's what will bring me good health. And that's also the secret for uh, losing weight and fixing obesity is to fix many different factors which go in and you know, together they cause obesity. And, you know, so I think the first step is always not instilling that mindset that you need to seek health first, not any particular weight. 
and you need to try to fix many little things. You know, that it's not a magic bullet thing. You know, you don't go, you know, whatever the latest fad is, whether it's, uh, you know, amphetamines <coughs> or uh, raspberry ketones or whatever yeah. it might be. You know. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so what is it that, so what in your opinion is kind of the formula? Um, you say that, uh, I've read in your book that if you're trying to lose weight, you should probably reduce some carbs, but not all, some fat, but not all. What is your kind of opinion on that? Because people get real picky about how much fat should I eat? How many carbs should I eat? Yeah. Well, I think the place you want to start is with a balanced, nutritious diet. And that's what our diet aims to be. And, you know, so a good rule of thumb is if you think about a plate, um, make a quarter of it what we call safe starches, so things like potatoes and rice, a quarter of it a sweet plant that's a natural whole food, you know, so no added sugar or anything like that, um, you know, but things like fruit, berries, beets, um, you know, a quarter of it some kind of vegetable, you know, so green leafy vegetables, onions, mushrooms, tomatoes, you know, there's all kind of vegetables you can use, uh, broccoli, bok choy, and then a quarter some kind of meat or fish. Um, get what we call supplemental foods that are rich in nourishment, so things like we recommend three egg yolks a day, uh, stock made from bone and bones and joints to provide collagen and minerals, uh, seafood, um, you know, so a diversity of food types uh, that bring a lot of benefits fermented vegetables, very good, um, and flavor things to taste, you know, even though you're trying to lose weight, your food should be delicious, all right? So, you know, good flavorings are things like saturated fat-rich fats, you know, so butter, uh, coconut milk are good ones. Um, the typical cooking acids like vinegar, lime juice, lemon juice, those are all great uh, to use for a sour flavor. And, uh, um, and umami flavors are good too, things like grated cheese, fish sauce, tamari sauce. Um, you know, so flavor your food to make it delicious. You know, have those proportions, get nutrient-dense natural whole foods. Don't take any empty calories. So a lot of people want to use protein powders, you know, which are just protein, no nutrition. You know, they want to use oils. Don't, don't use a lot of empty oils. Uh, when you're flavoring things with fat, use things like egg yolks or butter, all right? So milk, you know, from a cow, it's the nourishing food for babies. And so it has lots of nutrition in it. So if you're, if you're using dairy fats, you've got lots of nutrition associated with the butter. And, uh, you know, similarly egg yolks, they're nourishing, uh, you know, the, the embryonic chickens. And so they're full of nutrition, all right? So get nutrient-dense natural whole foods. Don't get empty calories. Don't get you know sugar. Uh, don't eat anything you know that when you look in the store and the first ingredients are starch, sugar, oil, in any combination. All right. Yeah. So those those are all going to be very bad foods for weight loss. Yeah. Um, and then you know once you're eating a nutritious, balanced diet, then actually the key factors are lifestyle things. And Really, the thing that has the most bang for the buck in terms of weight loss is intermittent fasting. Uh, um, so, and circadian rhythm and training. All right, those two. And so, what you want to do is uh, pick a feeding window that lies entirely in the daytime and is at most eight hours long. All right, so you have two meals, one at the beginning, one at the end, and you can snack as much as you want in the middle but you won't eat any calories outside of that feeding window. And so you have a 16-hour overnight fasting window, and, uh, you know, and in that you eat things like black coffee, like tea, uh, water, um, and you can flavor the water with uh, acids like vinegar or vitamin C powder or you know, something like that to make it tastier. Um, and if you, if you have any stress in the fast, make a vegetable soup out of, I mentioned bone broth, that's an important food. Just put a few vegetables in the bone broth, some salt, and uh, you know, make that little soup and eat that. Do you like um, coconut oil during the fast? No, I don't like any calories. Okay. Um, so, you know, coconut milk is a really good 
uh, fat source, but it's food and you want it in the, in the feeding window. Yeah. Yeah, I'm absolutely amazed when I say, for instance, I eat too late at night. Um, I'm always so much more hungry in the morning. But if I eat, I usually stop eating about 6 p.m. I eat dinner at 6 p.m. or 7. And then I don't eat again until 11 or 12 the next day. And when I eat at 6 or 7, I'm just not hungry in the morning. I'm amazed yeah. because I've, I've flipped on that fat switch and I'm burning fat for fuel. So I'm not hungry. Yeah. Well, night eating is very bad for weight loss. So you really don't want to eat it at night. Um, but you get to define your personal day. And in our home, we define it from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. All right. So you want a 12-hour day. And all of your food intake has to be in the daytime. So we'll eat as late as 8 p.m. And we try to finish dinner by 7, you know, sometimes we run a little late. And then we'll have a dessert at 8 p.m. And dessert is usually a bowl of fruit or berries, or it's a glass of organic whole milk with turmeric and maybe a little bit of honey. And, you know, so it's nice to get a little bit of sugar, like from the fruit or berries or the milk, uh, in order which, you know, helps prepare you for sleep and can improve sleep quality. Uh, and then, you know, we don't eat until noon the next day. Okay. Um, so we just have coffee in the morning. and uh, That's what I had this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, coffee's, coffee's quite good for you. <laughs> you know, as long as you have it early in the day. And it actually makes a fast more beneficial. So it will actually encourage weight loss. Mm. Um, you know, at least if you have black coffee. If you, you know, put lots of milk on your coffee, then it won't. <laughs> it'll, won't help weight loss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about the dreaded carb? Um, there's a lot of controversy with your book because uh, the typical paleo community, people say avoid potatoes like the plague just because cavemen didn't eat them. But of course we're not looking for a reenactment of the Paleolithic Lithic era. So uh, you recommend eating one pound of potatoes a day in your book, or safe starches rather. Um, but some people claim that even if they if they just look at a potato, they gain weight. So, what do you rec how do you recommend modifying the diet in that way if people don't tolerate carbohydrates? Yeah. Well, people, you know, first of all, anytime you starve yourself and then and then you end the starvation, you know, then you're going to gain weight temporarily. But it's actually, you know, you know, and very low carb dieting is a form of starvation. It's a form of carbohydrate starvation. Um, it's it's not particularly healthy. Um, lots of people get negative side effects. Um, I think probably everyone does. It just takes longer in some people than in others to show up. Um, you know, but that that weight gain is only temporary. You know, if you introduce the potatoes, then you know your weight will go up immediately. But once your body has the carbohydrates it needs, you know, then your weight will stop going up, and then it will start going down again. Um, and so lots of people have had this experience. Um, now, all right, so what's going on? Well, the optimal carbohydrate intake is around 30% of calories. Um, if you eat less than that and you provide enough protein, then your body will start manufacturing carbohydrate from protein because uh, it wants to get rid of the carbohydrate deficiency that, uh, you know, the dietary deficiency. It, it wants more carbohydrate. Yeah. Um, if you eat more carbohydrate, then it'll start converting uh, some of the carbohydrate to fat. So that starts happening when you get to about 40% carbs, uh, and above that point it converts about half of all the extra carbs to fat. Um, and the rest, it, it upregulates metabolism in order to uh, start burning more carbs for energy. And people who are diabetic or who have other metabolic problems may not handle an excess of carbohydrates well. So definitely diabetics always want to go below 30% carbs in their diet. And that's good advice for weight loss because, you know, with any nutrient, you don't want to give your body more than it wants and needs. You know, so if your body's trying to get rid of carbs by converting to fat, that's a sign you'd improve your health by reducing carb intake. And most Americans are around 50% carbs, so they're eating too many carbs. You know, so, you know, the low carb idea, it is, it is correct in the sense that, you know, 98% of Americans would improve their health by reducing their carb intake. But 
you can always in biology you can always take a you know you can always take things too far and if you cut carbs too much then you're now starving yourself of carbohydrates and that's one of those things that you know can aid weight loss temporarily but it's harming your health and you don't want to do it because that's the kind of thing that leads to yo-yo weight loss and then weight regain you know your body starts to get more and more impaired because of you know a chronic deficiency of a nutrient and your brain starts making you more and more hungry and you get these cravings for sugary things sometimes it's reflected as a craving for alcohol and um, and eventually people often you know and then when they find a carbohydrate like a potato uh, and they try to satisfy that craving then the brain recognizes oh we really need this and it makes you binge on the on the potatoes and then you say oh oh my weight is going up uh, but that's because you need it yeah. and so you know what people really need they need to tend to health first they need to give the body the nutrition it needs including the carbohydrate nutrition and if they do that then it'll benefit their ultimate goal weight loss in a number of ways so for instance starches they have a very healthy form of fiber called resistant starch which supports a healthy gut flora and a healthy gut flora is very important for weight loss um, obese people tend to have a very uh, non-diverse gut flora a restricted gut flora um, and they and that's often due to a history of low fiber diets that don't support a healthy you know gut microbiome um, Carbohydrates are also important for building extracellular matrix, which maintains the integrity of our gut barrier uh, and maintains immune function. And if you're not maintaining those things, you can get uh, various inflammatory health problems, which lead to weight gain. So adipose tissue is part of our immune system, and it's the main organ that releases uh, inflammatory cytokines that you know orchestrate the immune response. And when you have uh, an unresolved inflammatory condition, then often the adipose cells multiply because they say, oh, we need, to, we need to become bigger and stronger so we can release more cytokines and make an even stronger immune response against this threat. And so, you know, obesity is often accompanied by this systemic inflammation where the adipose cells are. Um, the immune cells are going to adipose tissue and saying, all right, we need more support from you, multiply, uh, and release more cytokines. And then the immune cells are releasing more cytokines and saying immune system, you know, cause more inflammation. And, you know, so you, you can get into uh, a bad state and it's not very healthy to have all that systemic inflammation. And, you know, so you need to support healthy immune function, healthy barrier function. You know, that's where things like the bone and joint stock and you know, good carbohydrate intake can come in. It's where getting a healthy microbiome comes in because uh, the right gut flora will help support gut health rather than whereas bad ones will tend to sabotage gut health. Um, so it's like I said in the beginning, there are many factors in weight loss and you know you want to address all of them. You know, yeah. but in the end, what we're always led back to is that, you know, what turns out to work optimally is actually very close to, you know, the ancestral, our ancestral, natural whole foods diet, ancestral lifestyle. Um, so, so I mentioned. Oh, I was going to say. Um, so I, I like how you say in your book that you need about 600 calories of carbohydrates for your basic bodily functions. And then if you go below that, then you're, um, you're, you can have reduced thyroid function. So a lot of people that are trying to lose weight who have low, as a result of low thyroid function, um, try to reduce their carbohydrates when that actually impedes your thyroid function even more. So can you tell us a little bit about that, about why you need to eat the 600 calories a day of starches or safe starches and carbohydrates in order to support healthy thyroid function? Yeah. So. Um Carbs are a nutrient, you know, they're not something you can just uh, remove from your diet without consequences. And, you know, so basically um, our bodies, for every nutrient, they have a triage function. Uh, so when a nutrient is abundant, 
they use it for every beneficial purpose, you know, that uh, the body can think of, you know, and that we evolved. Uh, but once it becomes scarce, then they triage it. They only give it to the most important uses, the ones that keep us alive, you know, that are needed to do urgent things like hunting and gathering food. You know, if we're starving, then the most important thing is to get food. So you need to support your brain, your muscles, you know, the things you would use to discover food, figure out where food is, and then go hunt it or gather it. And, um, and things that aren't immediately helping you get food, like immune function, like wound repair, like DNA maintenance, detoxification of the body from toxins, you know, those things will all be put off until later. And, um, you know, so for instance, if you under eat protein, the first thing you lose is detoxification in the liver and kidneys. Uh, you know, so all the proteins you need for detoxification will stop being made. You'll, you'll lose all the ones you have because they'll be cannibalized for amino acids to use elsewhere. And, you know, so you become very vulnerable to any kind of toxicity. And similarly, if you reduce carbohydrate, you're going to lose immune function first. Um, you're going to lose production of mucus, uh, of saliva, of tears. You're going to lose um, maintenance of extracellular matrix and gut barriers and other things. And, you know, you can lose, it's no problem to lose that maintenance of joint tissue, you know, for a day or a week or, you know, maybe a month. But over time, you know, over months and years, you know, not maintaining your, your joints is going to lead to problems. And so, uh, you know, so you want to provide enough. And, you know, what gets prioritized with when you go on a low carb diet is the brain uh, and so your blood glucose levels will be high they might even be increased you know, over what they were when you were eating carbs regularly uh, that's in order to provide the brain with carbohydrate but you get all these hormonal changes which tell other cell types don't utilize carbohydrate and one of them is the lower thyroid hormone levels uh, there's also various stress hormone levels go up uh, you know, so there's a there's a whole symphony orchestra of hormones that uh, you know adjust glucose utilization, and that uh, you know gets cells to stop using it. Um, but it's really it's to your advantage to continue supplying your body with the amount of carbohydrates that it wants in order to do all of the beneficial functions that it that it needs, and just avoid providing a carbohydrate excess. So, you know, if you give that 600 calories a day, you know, then your body will be able to maintain all the important health functions. Uh, but you won't have any of that excess that, you know, your body is dealing with, you know, that makes it convert some extra carbohydrate to fat. And, um, you know, so that's what you want to aim for. Enough for nutrition, but not an excess. Yeah. Um, and it's the same with every macronutrient. Uh, it's okay to have an excess of micronutrients, but you don't want to have an excess of macronutrients. So you basically want to get the optimal amount of each macronutrient that will allow your body to maintain all of its good functions, but not give an excess. And that's actually how the Perfect Health Diet was designed. We wanted to find the optimal amount of every nutrient, macronutrients and micronutrients. And, you know, so it turns out that design of the diet, which we were seeking to optimize health, it turns out to be optimal for weight loss too. Mm. A lot. Yeah. So a lot of people in the the low carb, high fat, the uh, you know arena, um, noticeably have a a, a low me lowered metabolism because they boast that they only have to eat one meal a day, and they're not usually not eating a lot of vegetables because <gasps> they have carbohydrates. So what are some of uh, what is, what is the problem, some of the intermittent problems with going low-carb, high-fat like that? I noticed you mentioned on your website that the ketogenic diet, which is also called low-carb, high-fat, promotes fungus and infection. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, well, um, you'll tend to get immune deficits, so the immune system tends to use a lot of glucose. And, you know, so if you go on a low-carb diet, uh, you know, then you're vulnerable to infections that you know, require a lot of reactive oxygen species to kill. Um, you know, so some 
you know, many bacterial infections, you know, going low carb is actually beneficial. Uh, but for some other types of infections, like fungal infections, you can't go too low carb or the immune system just won't be able to address them. Um, you know, I think the general issues with a low carb, high fat diet, you know, first of all, you're starving yourself of carbohydrate. And so, you know, that tends to produce some hunger and it tends to, you know, have some negative health effects. And, you know, so your brain, it recognizes that you're missing some nutrients that you need and so it tends to drive a little bit of hunger and cravings. And when people are forcing themselves to have a high ratio of fat in their diet, then actually in many cases, these, you know, people end up eating energy excess diets, you know, because they're getting extra oil, you know, more fat than their body needs. Yeah. And, and doesn't that clog it up? Doesn't that actually too much fat slow your metabolism and clog up well, your liver because it's having to process so much fat? Um, well, the biggest problem is what your body does is it ramps up uh, energy production and mitochondria to try to get rid of the oil and the fat. And, uh, and in that situation, with an excess of energy and excess of oil around, but uh, the mitochondria, it's, a, it's sort of a, uh, a two-way process. You, know, you put fats in on one end and you get ATP out the other end. But once you've burned a lot of fats and you filled your cells up with ATP more than they need, then it creates a kind of back pressure in the mitochondria and it leads the mitochondria to produce reactive oxygen species and that's kind of a signal, you know, don't give us any more energy. Um, but if you're eating an excess of fat, then it's kind of, you know, your body is also driving things from the other end saying, all right, mitochondria, you know, destroy more energy for us. We've got extra fat that we, that we need hanging around. And so what ends up happening is that the muscle tissue uh, which is the main place you dispose of excess energy is producing a lot of reactive oxygen species and that can lead to health problems especially if you're deficient in antioxidants and the place it will show up first is the heart often because you know the heart is a muscle muscle full of mitochondria and you know so it's generating lots of reactive oxygen species and the heart can really get damaged and I rather suspect that maybe what caused, uh, you know, what happens when you have too few antioxidants, too much reactive oxygen species, uh, you injure the, uh, the neighboring cells. And in the heart, you get uh, cardiomegaly, you get a, you know, injured heart tissue, the heart overgrows in order to make up for the lost function. Um, and then you're likely to have a heart attack um, and that's actually what Seth Roberts recently died of and I think part of it was he was eating this very high fat diet. He'd supplement uh, with flaxseed oil and with um, uh, butter and you know so he was eating you know a large amount of supplemental fat per day uh, because he found it improved certain biomarkers he was looking at which were related to brain and neurological function. Um, and, you know, the brain and the nerves, they're very fat-rich. So if you eat a fat-rich diet, you can see improvements in your know, brain and neurological function, but you can also see problems because of the reactive oxygen species being produced in muscle. Yeah, that's why I, the problem I have with a lot of medical testing or people that are kind of biohacking is that they're looking at other markers and ignoring some, and there's a lot of things you can't test, and there yeah. has to be a balance. You can't right. have too much of any nutrient. Yeah, so that's a fundamental problem with biohacking is that, you know, people can't wait and see, oh, is this going to kill me younger or older? You know, they're, you know, they're not, you know, you can't do 10,000 person trials, you know, that last 70 years in order to uh, get an answer on which, you know, approach is going to make people live the longest. So instead, people pick little biomarkers you know, and they say, oh, if this biomarker changes this way, it's improving my health. But biology is really complex. You know, there's no one biomarker that just predicts how long you're going to live. And, you know, if you make this biomarker become this number, then you're going to live another 50 years. You know, that's not how it works. And, you know, so you can, you know, quote, improve a biomarker 
uh, but you're actually harming, you know, you may be improving one aspect of your health, but you're harming another aspect. Yeah. And you can be shortening your lifespan and not realize it. You know, so, you know, in, in medicine they talk about, you know, don't treat the numbers, treat the patient, you know, trying to, you know, have the clinician have a holistic mindset. Uh, and, you, you know, you need the same kind of holistic mindset. Yeah, and I think people need to be very careful about having a myopia where right. and with their diet and with their health because say for instance a lot of my clients are testing their thyroid and they feel like they be, they eat a high fat diet, low carb diet which is very popular. Um, they're not realizing that that slows down their metabolism and then they have less less energy to detox or there's not enough um, their body's unable to detox as effectively. And then that over decades causes problems. Right. Yeah, so, you know, really the best course is to eat a nutrient-dense, balanced, natural whole foods diet. You know, don't go to one of these extreme diets. You know, we've known for a long time that, you know, if you eat a high-protein diet, that'll lead to rapid weight loss. If you, you know, if you cut out, if you go low-carb uh, along with the high-protein, and you know, or low-fat, or both, you know, then you can lose weight fairly rapidly. So, you know, for decades, you know, these diets like Atkins or the Ducan diet or, or others that just said, all right, eat lean meat and vegetables. And, you know, so you're getting lots of protein, not many fat or calories, you know, and you'll lose weight. And people would lose weight very quickly and the diet would go viral. But it didn't work for long term weight loss because it wasn't nourishing the body properly. Yeah. And you were missing all these things that come with carbs and with fat. Do you think they're and, okay short term? Well, um, yeah, I mean, short term, it's kind of like a fast, and you know, fasting is not a bad thing. It's you know, there's actually a term in the literature, protein sparing modified fast, which is basically a fast where you eat protein, um, and if you add in vegetables and salt, then you'll get and water, then you'll get electrolytes and fluids, and those are the things that stress people the first on a fast. Is you know, they become dehydrated, they lose electrolytes, they lose protein, you know. So that's basically it's a fast, but a fast is not, you know, a long-term diet, yeah. all right? So, um, you know, so it really should be called the Atkins temporary fast or the Ducan temporary fast rather than the, you know, than a diet. Um, you know, so if, if for some reason, you know, if there were like one event, you know, like Kate Middleton wanted to look slender for her wedding, all right, then, you know, a Ducan diet is like a temporary fast and you know, that will be effective at making you look good on your wedding day. But as far as a healthy diet and permanent weight normalization, you know, it's not, that's not a sustainable long-term approach and that's not the best way to do it. And if you do that kind of diet too much, it can lead to health problems. So, uh, you know, so really you should be doing something much more like the Perfect Health Diet, uh, PhD, and then, you know, with some tweaks like, um, you know, intermittent fasting, you know, make your intermittent fasting a little more, make the fast a little more strenuous, you know, make sure there are no calories in it. Um, if you don't drink coffee, take up drinking coffee because it actually helps with weight loss um, if, it's, if it's black. Um, you know, extend the fast, make it a little longer, do some exercise during the fast. Um, you know, get more exercise generally. Um, you know, pay closer attention to lighting and your light environment. Get rid of all white light at night. You know, install orange yellow lights around your home so that, you know, give yourself more time for sleep. Um, make sure you get more bright white light during the day. Get out in the sun more often. Um, you know, so there's all kinds of things you can do to make weight loss work better. Um, start making fermented vegetables like kimchi and eat those regularly to improve your, your gut microbiome. Eat liver if you're not already doing it. That's actually quite good for weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of things you can do that, you know, that people should be doing, you know, and they should be taking a long-term approach that's supportive of their health and that can lead to permanent weight normalization without hunger um, 
they shouldn't be eating a diet that makes them hungry. They shouldn't be eating a diet that gives them cravings uh, or that leads them to binge. Uh, they shouldn't eat a diet that drives them to drink alcohol in large quantities. Um, you know, they, they should be taking care of themselves, getting well nourished. So you recommend avoiding grains except for white rice on the Perfect Health Diet. Yep. And all my clients basically gasp when I tell them that they can eat white rice. And <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about why you uh, recommend that? And is it okay to eat non-gluten grains like quinoa and other things like that? Yeah. Um, in general, you want to avoid grasses. Um, so you want to avoid the seeds of grasses. And you know that means things like wheat and barley and uh, and so on. And um, rice is in that category. Um, the reason you want to avoid seeds of grasses is they all have compounds that sabotage our digestion, and um, you know and can sabotage other cells, cell types as well if they get in our body. And you know so they're basically toxic to us. And what's special about rice? is in normal cooking, uh, you destroy most of the toxins. If you cook in a pressure cooker, you destroy all of them. And so rice becomes a very, white rice becomes a very safe food. And so, um, you know, so we have this category that we call safe starches that are good starch sources for people to eat. And, um, and it's very desirable to get some starches in your diet, uh, partly because they're a good, they're one of the best carbohydrate sources, or the best carbohydrate source, and they're also a good source of fiber. And um, and the only trick is you want to eat starches as part of a meal. Uh, you never want to eat starches as a snack. So fruit makes a good snack. In general, sugary things are better snacks. Uh, sugary foods like fruit or berries. So if you want a snack, eating a banana or an apple is terrific. Um, you shouldn't eat a potato as a snack. You shouldn't eat white rice as a snack. And most people, you know, their bodies sort of know that, so they don't. Uh, but as part of a meal, and combined with the meat, with vegetable, with uh, fats and acids, you know, the kind of flavorings that we talked about at the beginning, uh, starch becomes very healthy. It, it has a low glycemic index as part of a meal and you know so even diabetics can have a good starchy meal uh, without you know having uh, uh, big problems with their blood glucose. And doesn't putting vinegar on starches and other um, like flavorings like that reduce the glycemic index? Uh, yes that's right. So um, so uh, you can reduce the glycemic index in a variety of ways, and one of them is to eat it with fiber. Uh, you get that through vegetables. One is to eat it with fats. Uh, you know, so putting butter or sour cream on your potatoes is a good idea. And one of them is to add acids, so things like vinegar and uh, pickle juice or lemon lime juice. You know, they'll all. Uh, reduce the glycemic index of your starches. I'll have to try that. Put some pickle juice on my potato. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. So, what about brown rice? Um, why do you not recommend brown rice? And can you eat it in the form of, say, puffed rice cakes or organic puffed rice cakes? Because there's a, you know, a few of the, the processed brown, uh, processed rice foods that a lot of my clients like to eat, like rice cereal and things like that. Um, but do you think that the processing reduces the toxins, or should you just generally avoid all brown rice products? Well, ideally, you would avoid them. Um, so uh, I mentioned all the toxins in grass seeds, uh, the seeds of grass plants, and they're generally concentrated in the bran, and that's true with rice. And you know, so the bran is what gets milled off to make white rice, and so white rice is lower in toxicity than brown rice. And so in general, you should try to avoid brown rice if you can. And also, industrial food preparation is generally harmful, especially for starches. So starches tend to be pretty fragile. They don't like being dried out and heated. And you know, most industrial food producers, they want to move food through the factory very quickly. It's messy to handle water, so they do dry heat. And 
they produce toxins out of starches like acrylamide. Uh, acrylamide can form at temperatures only a little above the boiling point of water in dry start from dry starch. And so you tend to get a lot of acrylamide. You know, and that's like when you look at a potato chip, the little brown stains, you know, will have a lot of acrylamide in them. And um, and that's a you know cancer causing toxin. Um, so in in general industrial food products are not as healthy as any home cooked uh, starches would be. And brown rice containing foods are not as healthy as white rice containing foods would be. And so my general counsel would be to avoid it. Now if you if you have to get some kind of industrial produced snack out of the supermarket then maybe a brown rice cake is better than uh, you know than a wheat product. And you know, we've eaten rice crackers uh, from time to time, purchased in a, in a store, and, you know, just had like cheese on rice crackers or something. Uh, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's perfect. It would be better to, you know, cook white rice at home and have uh, a natural whole food. Yeah. And so what about the non-gluten grains? Uh, are you okay with those, or do you feel like that only white rice is, is okay? Well, it's it's similar. So white rice is the only one we approve of, you know. But I'll I'll agree that oats are healthier than wheat, you know. So if you wanted to, in, if you wanted to include a wider selection of grains, then uh, you know oats and oatmeal might be a good place to start. Do you like quinoa or spelt? Um, not that much. We don't eat them ourselves at home. Um, I think we gave quinoa a grade of C when we discussed it. You know, so we use this grading system A, B, C, D, E, F, and if it's F, then it's forbidden. You know, so quinoa isn't forbidden, but it's not encouraged either. Okay. You know, so, um, and you know, so for comparison, you know, buckwheat. I think we gave a B. You know, I'd say buckwheat is better than uh, quinoa. And, um, you know, but, uh, you know, white rice, white potatoes would be uh, grade A. Um, you know, so buckwheat, the nice thing about that is buckwheat flour is really good for uh, uh, baking. You know, so if you want to make baked bake products, uh, which aren't quite as healthy as uh, non-flour, you know, cellular products, but... Uh, uh, they can make great treats, and yeah, you, know, you have to have a muffin. <laughs> yeah, well, we have some uh, uh, muffin recipes on our website, and uh, you know, Brazilian cheese balls, and uh, uh, you know, we'll probably have a pizza dough recipe in our cookbook. So, um, you know, I think uh, baked goods are okay from time to time. Uh, and yeah, so. Even and what about fruit? You know, a lot of dieters think that eating a ton of fruit is a really good strategy for weight loss. I know at one point, way back in the day, I was trying to lose weight. I would eat a huge plate of fruit for breakfast, thinking that I was doing great. Um, and I wasn't really losing weight very effectively. Uh, but So why is it important to watch your fructose when you're trying to lose weight? Well, fructose, if, if you eat it in excess, uh, then it doesn't get absorbed and it's available to gut bacteria and that can distort your gut microbiome or it can even lead to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth uh, because you know fructose is there and available to the bacteria you know it gets consumed very quickly and the bacteria can migrate up to where the fructose is in your digestive tract and you know when you get that that's not that's not good for you that tends to you know create that kind of leaky gut and inflammatory issues that uh, lead to weight gain um, so that's one source of problems and the other source of problems is too much fructose in the liver can react with polyunsaturated fats to damage the liver and that can and the liver is an important metabolic regulatory organ so that can lead to problems with uh, you know lead, it can promote metabolic syndrome and, and obesity um, so too much fructose is a bad idea but uh, generally speaking, it's hard to get too much fructose by eating natural whole foods. You know, you, you tend to get it when you start adding sugar to uh, things or 
you know, drinking Coca-Cola or whatever it is, you know, getting high fructose corn syrup or, you know, but if you're just eating fruit, you're trying to be okay. But, you know, a plate full of fruit for breakfast, it's not a balanced diet. Yeah. You know, you need, uh, you need a whole host of things, many of which come from animal foods. Uh, you know, you want some fatty, you know, fat associated nutrients, you want protein associated nutrients. Um, and, you know, you want relatively more glucose than fructose, and you can achieve that by eating starch, which gives you resistant starch fiber and helps your gut microbiome. So there's a lot of ways in which you benefit, you know, by just keeping fruit intake relatively moderate. Um, you know, so I probably eat uh, three pieces of fruit a day. Oh, wow. And that's probably about perfect. You know, I, um, you know, you certainly don't, you know, nutritionally, you don't need more than that. Yeah. So what is your maximum recommendation of fructose intake per day? Um, well, we, we pretty much say the optimum is around 25 grams of fructose. So actually a little bit of fructose is beneficial to you. You know, so that's a hundred calories, which works out to about a pound of fruit a day. And a pound of fruit is usually going to be around three pieces. Um, and so that's what we would call optimal. And then, uh, you know, but in any optimum, if you've studied calculus, you know that the optimum is always kind of flat at the top. So you don't really lose much by adding a little more beyond that. And then if, if you know, your um, things start to fall off as you get farther away, um, you know, so it's just within, you know, moderation. I would say, you know, don't eat more than five or six pieces of fruit a day. Mm -hmm. um, and what about people that have gut issues? So they've got some intestinal, intestinal issues, digestive issues, gut dysbiosis. Will eating fruit contribute to those? Or is there some recommendation about people maybe reducing fruit in their diet while they're trying to heal those issues? Um, well, fruit is, fruit is pretty benign, but you definitely want to get a diversity of foods. So if you're having gut problems, I'd aim for what we consider our optimum, you know, so maybe two or three pieces of fruit a day. And, um, you know, and try to get additional fiber from vegetables instead, which have fewer calories. You know, so you might eat spinach, you might eat onions, you might eat tomatoes, you might eat, uh, you know, stock vegetables or, uh, uh, you know, just a diversity of vegetables, eat some seaweed. Um, so, you know, I think the more diverse your food intake, uh, the more likely you are to have a diverse gut flora. Uh, the more diverse your fiber intake, uh, the more likely it is to be a healthy mix of fiber. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so some people, you know, seem to have the idea that, uh, it's good to, you know, like there's the Soylent movement where, you know, every once in a while someone writes me, you know, can you comment on my Soylent formula, you know, my personal Soylent formula, what's, what's wrong with it, you know, where they have these, you know, purified nutrients and, you know, there's usually many nutrients that are missing, but they don't realize there's many nutrients, you know, that food has that we don't even know, you know, we need to get. and. Uh, you know, so those kinds of things are a problem, and I think it can also be a problem to be, uh, you know, supplementing with fiber. You know, so in the paleo movement right now, we have you know a lot of people who supplement with potato starch, and uh, and I don't I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it you know it it's got to be better to eat the natural whole foods. So you know you can eat potatoes. Uh, it's good to cook them and cool them, which increases the fiber content. And, um, uh, you know, and that's, a, that's a, a good approach, but you want to get a diversity of fiber, you know, from fruits, from vegetables, from starches, uh, from a variety of sources. And what about coconut sugar? Do you support its use since it's only 3% fructose as opposed to cane sugar, which is 50% fructose? Um, well, you could use, you know, one of the low fructose sugars if you're going to add sugar 
to things. Uh, you can buy dextrose powder, which is purified glucose. And you know, even if it was originally came from cornstarch, it's uh, you know after they purified it, it's it's just as healthy uh, as any any other source of glucose. But um, we really don't recommend you know adding sweetener, adding sugar to things. You know, unless you're making ice cream or something, you know, but only for an occasional treat. You know, most of your sweetness should come from natural whole foods. So you can chop up you know, fruit or berries, you can puree them in a food processor and use pureed raspberries as a sweetener. Yeah. Um, and, you know, most people will find they don't really need a lot of sugar in order to make things taste great and taste sweet. Um, you know, so when you add uh, sugar to things, you tend to over add it as far as, you know, what you need for pleasure. That's me. <laughs> no, actually, I use a lot of stevia. I like I just use lots and lots of stevia and everything. <laughs> yeah, I think you know we would recommend sticking to natural whole foods, and you know I think if you puree berries or fruit, you know that would be a great sweetener in most contexts. And uh, if you had to use something, you could use honey, um, or you could use dextrose powder. Um, you know something like that. Well, Paul, why don't you tell listeners uh, about what you think is the most pressing health issue in the world today? Uh, you know, I think the most, I, I, I would say too, I would say it's going away from natural whole foods to uh, industrial food products that are, uh, you know, convenient for the consumer, but they're really put together not with health in mind, but with, you know, low cost production and you know, low cost in terms of ingredients, so they'll have like soybean oil instead of a healthier oil, and low cost in terms of production, so they've been sped through the factory with these, you know, dry, high heat manufacturing methods that produce more food toxins. Um, and so I think that's a major problem. Then I think the other major problem is lifestyle. You know, that people are really pursuing disruptive, you know, lifestyles that are disruptive to their circadian rhythms. They never fast. They don't get enough sunlight or bright light during the day. They get too much light at night. Their sleep is sh too short. Uh, their evenings are too stressful, too social. Um, their daytime is uh, not active enough. Uh, they eat too much food at night. All kinds of the scheduling and uh, uh, lifestyle issues. And I mentioned our perfect health retreats. That's one thing, you know, where we control the environment, we control the schedule, and we show people how to live a healthy lifestyle. And they've been extremely effective for weight loss. Yeah. And you know, people often, you know, lose weight very rapidly. And we're not depriving of them them of food. You know, they can eat as much food as they want. They can have seconds, uh, and nobody's hungry. And you know, we tell them eat enough so that you're not hungry. And at the end of your overnight fast. Is it lights out at 10 p.m.? Oh, <laughs> well, no. What we do is we install orange lighting all over the place, including the bedrooms. And so, you know, as long as you stay up, you can have the lights on, but they're orange lights. And it's only blue uh, frequency light that uh, disrupts your circadian rhythm. So you can go with as much red, yellow, orange lighting as you want at night, and uh, and you know what we find is when you know when people are seeing only orange light from 8 p.m. onward, they really they don't want to stay up till midnight or 1 1 p.m. They start getting sleepy. Yeah, I know? installed the Flux program on my computer to yeah. uh, give me the orange light as opposed to the blue that will stimulate my brain and keep me awake. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, white light tends to keep people awake and encourage them to stay up longer. But, uh, you know, when you when you alter the environment properly, then you know, people tend to go to sleep and they go to sleep early enough to get a full night's sleep. Uh, and they sleep well, they sleep better. And, uh, you know, so we really, you know, apart from installing orange yellow lighting in people's bedrooms and, you know, switching to orange yellow lighting in the common areas, no, we don't need to control anything about people. They can do whatever they want in the bedroom, and it'll usually be very good for them. Yeah, so I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, Paul, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's so informative, and I know that a lot of the listeners are going to get a lot out of how to um, how to do your diet, how to, and hopefully pique their interest in the Perfect Health Diet, which I think is just uh, it's just incredible. I think uh, you've really written uh, a seminal book on diet, and um, thank you for your your ideas on how to maybe tweak it just a little bit uh, for weight loss. Yeah, thank you very much, Wendy. Yeah, I, I do think it's a terrific diet for weight loss. So. And so do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about where they can find you and kind of what you're up to these days? Yeah, so our website is perfecthealthdiet.com. And I encourage anyone, you know, if you want to learn how to be healthy, you can save yourself a lot of time by coming to our retreats, you know, to enjoy a luxury vacation. And, you know, like I said, there's really a uh, hundred or more things most people are doing wrong uh, that leads to weight gain. And, you know, even people who have read our book four or five times, you know, and then come to our retreats and say, oh, I, I learned a lot of new things. And it might still be in the book, but you can easily overlook, yeah. um, you know, some things. And so it really helps to see things in action and learn in person. And so if you really want to lose weight effectively, normalize your weight and make yourself healthy for the rest of your life, then I strongly recommend coming to our retreats and you just get a luxury vacation as a bonus. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Again, thank you for coming on the show. All right, thank you very much, Wendy. And listeners, if you want to learn all about detoxification and the modern paleo diets or how to heal your health conditions naturally, uh, you can come visit my site, livetoone110.com. And you can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter at I Will Live to 110. And you can view this video podcast on my YouTube channel, Wendy Live to 110. And if you like what you heard on the show, please go give the Live to 110 podcast a review on iTunes. That would be wonderful if you took two minutes of your time to go do that. And again, thank you guys for tuning in. And thank you so much for listening to the Live to 110 podcast.